Und deshalb sagen wir auch, nach 78 Jahren ist es an der Zeit, dass die US-Soldaten nach Hause gehen. Alle anderen Alliierten haben längst Deutschland verlassen. Diese Zeiten sind lange vorbei, aber wir bleiben dabei. Die US-Atomwaffen müssen weg. A politician in Germany delivered a powerful speech on the floor of the parliament, known as the Bundestag, condemning the US military occupation of her country. The US has had thousands of troops occupying Germany since the end of World War II, in 1945, and they've never left. Still today, the U.S. has more than 38,000 troops in Germany, and a member of the left party, a socialist anti-imperialist politician named Sevim Dagdalin, gave a very powerful speech condemning the U.S. military for undermining the sovereignty of Germany. Freundschaft miteinander aber heißt, dass wir das bisherige Verhältnis einer extremen Unterwürfigkeit der Bundesrepublik gegenüber einer US-amerikanischen Außenpolitik aufkündigen, die geprägt ist von Krieg, Völkerrechtsbrüchen und Putschunterstützung. She said that the United States treats its so-called allies as vassals and she says that countries in Europe need to have more independence. Die US-Administration vermittelt den Eindruck, sie wolle gar keine Alliierten, sondern schlicht Vasallentreue. Das aber wollen sich immer weniger Staaten weltweit gefallen lassen, und das ist auch gut so. And she also called for the United States to withdraw its nuclear weapons. In addition to having dozens of military bases and military installations in Germany, the U.S. has, has nuclear weapons, which of course threaten Germany, because if there's a nuclear war, between, for example, NATO and Russia, Germany could become a target. Es gab mal eine Zeit, da hatte der Deutsche Bundestag mehr Mut. Ich erinnere an den Beschluss zum Abzug der US-Atomwaffen 2010, auch auf Initiative des FDP-Außenministers Westerwelle. Dieser Beschluss ist bis heute nicht umgesetzt worden. This German lawmaker, Sevim Dagdalin, also pointed out that in the US military bases in German territory, the German constitution does not apply. These are, this is effectively occupied territory in which US law applies, despite the fact that it's physically in Germany. And German bases like the Rammstein Air Base are used to launch air attacks, including the US drone war. Die US Militärstützpunkte verhalten sich wie extraterritoriale Gebiete, auf denen das Grundgesetz ausgehebelt ist. Von deutschem Boden werden völkerrechtswidrige US-Kriege, Drohnenmorde und Folterflüge mit durchgeführt. Und als gelte immer noch das Besatzungsstatut, laden die USA zu den Rammstein-Formaten in Deutschland ein. I published an article about this over at geopoliticaleconomy.com, which includes the text of Dag Dillon's speech, and, and I will link to that in the description below. Now, this leftist German politician, Savim Dag Dillon, is one of the very few politicians in Europe who has been speaking out against the NATO proxy war in Ukraine. She has said very clearly that the war in Ukraine is a NATO proxy war against Russia, seeking the overthrow of the Russian government. Here at Geopolitical Economy Report, we did an interview with Sevim, and she condemned the, this proxy war and called for peace negotiations to end it. So we need Germany actually be emancipated at last and Europe finally to assert itself ending the non-sensual, well, without a sense, uh, economical war and launching a European diplomatic initiative to end the war in Ukraine. This would be the start to emancipate themselves from the US administration and not being a vassal state of the United States anymore. In the description below, I will link to the interview that we did with Savim Dagdalin about the proxy war in Ukraine. Now, in this latest speech that Savim Dagdalin gave on the floor of the Bundestag, which was on March 31st, she also condemned the destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines. These are the gas pipelines that connected Russia to Germany. And let's not forget that these, these are often referred to in the Western media as Russian pipelines, but they were also German. The Russian state-owned gas giant Gazprom was one of the main investors in this project, but there were also companies in Germany and France and Switzerland and other parts of Europe 
and they lost their billions of dollars of investment in this massive infrastructure project that was essentially an attack on Europe itself. And in her speech, uh, Savim Dagdalan referred to this as an act of terrorism and said, why are our so-called allies committing terrorism against us? Jetzt lässt sich die Bundesregierung von den USA mit der Lieferung der Leopard-Panzer mitten ins Feuer schicken. Jetzt weigert sich die Bundesregierung, eine internationale Untersuchungskommission zur Aufklärung der Terroranschläge auf die Nord Stream Pipelines mit zu unterstützen. Ich sage Terror und Anschläge unter Freunden, das geht gar nicht. The Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Seymour Hirsch, one of the world's most renowned investigative reporters, he exposed that the US government destroyed the Nord Stream pipelines. It was overseen by the Joe Biden administration and it was carried out by the US military with the support of NATO member Norway. So when this German politician Savim Dagdalen says that terror attacks among friends cannot be tolerated, she's clearly referring to the United States carrying out this terror attack. Now, in the same speech, Savim Dagdalen also called out the hypocrisy of the German government. Not only has it refused to investigate the destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines, but she also called out the German government for not calling for the release of the journalist Julian Assange, the world's most famous journalist of WikiLeaks, who has been suffering in a British maximum security prison, and the US is trying to extradite him and throw him in prison for the rest of his life for the so-called crime of publishing truthful information. And Savim Dagdalin called this out. Warum aber, fragt man sich, weigert sich die Bundesregierung auch nach 20 Jahren den US-Angriffskrieg auf den Irak als Völkerrechtsbruch zu verurteilen? Warum setzen Sie sich nicht für die Freilassung des Journalisten Julian Assange ein, dem wegen der Veröffentlichung von US-Kriegsverbrechen 175 Jahre Haft in den USA drohen, Frau Baerbock? Warum haben Sie dem Dissidenten Edward Snowden kein Asyl angeboten? Now, Savim Dagdalen, of course, as a, an anti-imperialist, as an anti-fascist, as a socialist, she is very much against the genocidal, murderous Nazi regime. And in her speech, she made it clear that Germany, the people of Germany were grateful for the US military support in fighting against the Nazi regime. However, she pointed out that the Soviet Union did the vast majority of the work in defeating Hitler, in defeating Nazi Germany. Der heutige Anlass, Tag ist Anlass genug, dem Befreiern Deutschlands zu danken. Die Hauptlast im Kampf gegen den deutschen Faschismus trug die Sowjetunion, aber ohne die gemeinsame Anstrengung der USA, Großbritanniens und Frankreichs hätte dieser so wichtige Sieg über die Barbarei nicht errungen werden können. 400.000 US-Soldaten haben im Zweiten Weltkrieg ihr Leben im Kampf gegen den japanischen Militarismus und den deutschen Faschismus verloren. Ihnen gilt unser Angedenken. Vor Ihnen verneigen wir uns in Demut. Ihnen gilt unser ganzer Dank. Gegen den antisemitischen Hass und die rassistische Hetze des Dritten Reiches setzen wir die Freundschaft der Völker. Freundschaft mit den Völkern der Sowjetunion, mit Franzosen und Briten und der amerikanischen Bevölkerung. The United States was an ally, it did help, but the Soviet Union sacrificed more than 26 million people in the fight against the Third Reich. In fact, more than three quarters of all Nazi casualties were on the Eastern Front in the fight against the Soviet Union. And the United States and Britain each lost around 400,000 people compared to more than 26 million people in the Soviet Union, which shows that it was the Soviet Union that defeated Nazism, not the US and Britain. They helped, but they, they did not defeat the, the Nazis. And, and in her speech, Dagdalen acknowledged that. Now, it's often not mentioned enough, but it's an extremely important detail to keep in mind that the United States has more than 100,000 troops in Europe. In 2022, the US military news website Stars and Stripes reported that, that the US has 100,000 troops in Europe for the first time since 2005. And that was at the peak of the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq. And specifically, Germany has the most US troops in all of Europe 
And as of 2022, the U.S. had 38,500 troops in Germany. The U.S. also has 12,000 troops in Italy. Poland and Britain have 10,000 U.S. troops. Romania has 2,400 U.S. troops. And Spain has 2,500 U.S. troops. And the U.S. also has 2,500 troops in the Baltic states, which is Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, and 1,500 more U.S. troops in Slovakia. This is ironic because we have heard a lot of propaganda from the United States about the former Soviet Union accusing the Soviet Union of supposedly treating East Germany, the German Democratic Republic, the socialist government that ceased to exist with German reunification in 1990, the U.S. frequently portrayed that government as a puppet regime of the Soviet Union, despite the fact that it was not part of the Soviet Union. It was part of the Warsaw Pact, which was the Soviet version of NATO, which was created after NATO, by the way. NATO was created first, and the Warsaw Pact was created in response to defend the Soviet Union and other allies, socialist allies in Eastern Europe against NATO wars and NATO regime change operations and coups and such. And the Soviet Union, ironically, had asked to join NATO, but NATO said no. And Germany was West Germany was then then capitalist West Germany was added to NATO in 1955. And in response to that, the Soviet Union created the Warsaw Pact and East Germany joined the Warsaw Pact. We should never forget that history because it helps us understand today and the fact that the constant NATO encirclement of Russia, the expansion of NATO after the reunification of Germany in 1990, right up to Russia's borders, that was not new. NATO was always an aggressive force that was aimed at destabilizing Moscow from its very creation in 1949. And the Warsaw Pact was not created until 1955, after West Germany joined NATO. And we have a lot of evidence showing that the U.S., Britain, and France promised the Soviet Union in 1990 that if it allowed German reunification, then they would not expand NATO one inch east, and they lied. They expanded NATO exclusively to the east, over a dozen times or adding a dozen more than a dozen new members since then. So the reason I mention all of that is because at the end of World War II in 1945, the Allied powers occupied Germany and that was supposed to end in 1949. And yet the United States really never ended its military occupation of Germany. The Soviet Union withdrew from East Germany in 1948 and yet the U.S. troops never left. There still are more than 38,000 troops today in Germany. They've been there since 1945. That is why this German leftist politician, Savim Dagdalin, is calling for an end to the U.S. military presence and nuclear weapon presence in Germany. Now, a key detail that Dagdalin mentioned in her speech in the Bundestag was that in 2010, the German parliament, the Bundestag, voted to withdraw the U.S. nuclear weapons from the country. And here we are in 2023, 13 years later, and the U.S. never withdrew those nuclear weapons. This was admitted by the German state media outlet DW. DW wrote, quote, In March 2010, Germany's parliament, the Bundestag, passed a cross-party resolution urging the government to emphatically work toward getting its American allies to withdraw all nuclear weapons from Germany, a decade on, that goal seems ever more elusive. Now, rather than working toward the bomb's withdrawal, the U.S. military is set to modernize and upgrade them. So when the, this leftist German politician, Dagdalin, portrayed the U.S. military presence as a kind of neo-colonial occupation, it's not hyperbolic. The German parliament, elected by the German people, voted for the withdrawal of U.S. nuclear weapons 13 years ago, and Washington refused to do it. Instead, the U.S. military is spending more than $1 trillion expanding its nuclear weapons program, modernizing its nuclear weapons. This is a report from Columbia University's Center for Nuclear Studies, and it notes that 
it, they analyzed the data that was published by the U.S. Congressional Budget Office and found that the, the plan for modernizing nuclear weapons is going to cost $1.2 trillion. And by the way, that was just $2017. If you update it according to inflation today and look at what the, the cost would be in 2023 dollars, we're talking about 1.49. So about one and a half trillion dollars, according to the U.S. Congressional Budget Office Office's own estimates of what the U.S. is spending to modernize its nuclear weapons. And that is probably a very conservative estimate, honestly. Now, I want to conclude this analysis with one other final detail. It's very important. And that is that when Savini Dagdalen gave this speech on the floor of the Bundestag on March 31st, she was speaking at an event that was about the 75th anniversary of the Marshall Plan. And the way that this is often taught in public schools in the United States, the way I learned about it, is this, this was a benevolent plan in which the U.S. was just helping rebuild Europe after World War II. In reality, it was not benevolent. First of all, Europe had to pay back the United States. It's not just all free aid. But furthermore, even more importantly, for the United States, the Marshall Plan was a way to maintain U.S. economic hegemony. It was also to prevent Europe, Western Europe, from going socialist. And it was a way for the United States to maintain a, mac a huge market for U.S. goods. Because at the end of World War II, the U.S. was responsible for over half of global industrial production. And the U.S. had all of this production that it had built up during the war. And it needed markets for those products. And instead of just raising the living standards and wages of U.S. workers, which would cut into the profits of the corporations, instead, the U.S. looked for new markets in Europe. And by giving these loans to Europe in dollars, it was a way of incentivizing Europe to recycle those dollars back in the U.S. economy by buying products from U.S. companies. This is admitted even if you look, for instance, at the National World War II Museum, which is a U.S. government-backed, U.S. Congress-recognized museum. It admitted that in 1945, the United States was manufacturing more than half of the produced goods in the world. U.S. exports made up more than one third of the total global exports. And the United States held roughly two thirds of the available gold reserves. So one of the, the ways that the U.S. still maintained its economic hegemony was through the Marshall Plan, named after the U.S. Secretary of State, George Marshall. And it acknowledges that, that this was a way of helping to bolster the economic strength and international prominence of the United States. So it's not about helping Europe. It's about maintaining U.S. economic hegemony. And I would add it's about keeping Europe economically subordinated to the United States, which is exactly what we see today with more and more subordination of Europe to Washington. And this, the World War II Museum, the U.S. government-backed museum, acknowledges that it was about protecting markets for American goods, about massive markets in Europe for U.S. goods. And they added that the United States invested in the Marshall Plan in rebuilding economic markets in Europe to promote its own goods. And also, the Marshall Plan served as a conduit for the spread of capitalism across Western Europe, hindering the global power and influence of the Soviet Union. So it was about geopolitics and economic hegemony and imperialism and capitalism. It was not about helping Europe. We see how the U.S. is helping Europe today by, you know, blowing up pipelines and imposing sanctions on Russia, which blow back on the European working class who have to pay more and more for their energy. They have high rates of inflation. So the European working class is suffering the economic uh, consequences of this the proxy war the U.S. fundamentally is leading against Russia, just as, you know, the Marshall Plan was not a benevolent plan. So we see, you know, how little history has changed. Now, finally, I'm going to conclude here looking at a brief passage from the book Super Imperialism, The Origins and Fundamentals of U.S. World Dominance by the economist Michael Hudson, friend of the show, a genius. And he spelled out very clearly what the goal of the Marshall Plan was in his chapter Monetary Imperialism, about the U.S. monetary imperialism. And he noted that Apart from the moral appeal of a more open world economy, 
The United States provided Marshall aid, Plan aid to war-torn Europe and offered foreign aid loans to cover the trade deficits anticipated to result from an international economy that everyone recognized would be dominated by U.S. exporters and investors. So it was a way of giving loans, again, not free money, loans to Europe in dollars so Europe could use those dollars to import U.S. products. So there was a massive balance of payments uh, problem here where Europe was importing a lot from the United States and the U.S. was a surplus exporter. It had a massive export surplus, a current account surplus, because it was exporting all of these products as a major industrial power. And in order to buy those products, Europe needed dollars. And they got the dollars through loans from the Marshall Plan. And Michael Hudson continued saying that this U.S. lending was designed to make the post-war system palatable enough for Europe and other regions to adopt relatively free trade and open their doors to U.S. investors as currencies were made freely convertible and nations agreed not to use devaluation to bolster their international payments at U.S. expense. What he's acknowledging there is that they had an agreement that was made at the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944 in which the U.S. dollar was made the global reserve currency and the U.S. dollar was pegged to gold at a fixed rate of $35 for each troy ounce of gold. But the, these other allied nations of the U.S. agreed not to devalue their currency, which would make their exports much more competitive. Because if a foreign company is going to import your products, if they're paying in your currency and the currency of your, of your country is devalued, it's less powerful, but the, the cost of the product is the same, that means that your exports are cheaper, which makes you more competitive. But these countries agreed not to devalue their currency because that would hurt the competitiveness of U.S. exports. So that was a way for the U.S. to maintain its massive surplus that it had at this time. And Michael Hudson has pointed out that the U.S. had a trade surplus until the Korean War and then the Vietnam War when the U.S. started running a massive current account deficit. And that deficit came because of military spending to fund the U.S. empire and the hundreds of military bases around the world. Now, as in addition to maintaining a market in Europe for U.S. goods, the United States insisted as a condition for this aid to Europe that it be given veto power in the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the World Bank. And still today, the United States is the only country that has veto power in these institutions that were created in the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944. And it's one of the ways that the U.S. has maintained its economic hegemony over much of the world, largely the global south, but also Europe. So all this is to show that the system that the U.S. created at the end of World War II was a system that subordinated Western Europe to U.S. imperialism. And still today, that explains why there are 100,000 U.S. troops in Europe. There are 38,000 troops in Germany. There are dozens of U.S. military bases across Europe. The U.S. uses those bases to wage war around the world. And it basically has its own, uh, you know, fiefdoms where local law does not apply in those bases, in those U.S. military installations. Unfortunately, there are not many politicians in Europe who have been speaking out against this, but one of the, the few who is, is the German leftist politician, Sevim Dagdalin of the left party, Die Linke. And I, in the description below, I have linked to the article that has her speech that she gave in the Bundestag on March 31st. And I also, in the description below, will link to the other interview that I did with Sevim Dagdalin talking about the proxy war in Ukraine and her activism trying to bring a peaceful resolution to that war. I'm going to wrap up here. I'm Ben Norton. This is Geopolitical Economy Report. If you like the work that we do here, please consider supporting us over at geopoliticaleconomy.com support, or you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash geopoliticaleconomy. We have no institutional support. We're completely independent and grassroots. So any support you could provide would go a long way. If you're watching or listening, please subscribe. I want to thank everyone and I'll see you next time.